Okay, so assalamualaikum and welcome everyone to the second lecture of, on content computing. Um, we've already gone through the rules yesterday, but um, I again like to re-emphasize that please keep your mics muted throughout the lecture, of course, until you're asking a question. And Dr. Sabi will stop in between for questions and answers. So do not worry if you have any question, you can type it in the chat or wait till he stops for it. So. Um, secondly, you all must have received the invitation to join the Google Classroom. In case you haven't, you can send me an email. And we will we'll be sharing with you the PDF of these lectures. And we'll, we'll soon decide about the recorded sessions as well and get back to you about it. So over to Dr. Sabi now. Hey. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining the second session. Uh, special thanks to all our friends from the University of Jordan, uh, who for them probably it's early morning. Uh, we have people from uh, different parts of the world, different countries joining in these sessions. So I'm really excited about, about all of this. Uh, Mohsina, is my voice audible, properly audible? Yes, sir, it is. All right, okay. So today we're going to start our second session uh, on quantum computing. So let's get started. And today we're going to do something really interesting. We're going to build our first quantum computer, uh, the very basic quantum computer that I can think of. And it is based on the concept of interferometry. So our quantum computer is really an interferometer. And in this lecture, you will really see how counterintuitive, how counter natural these quantum computers are. Uh, and in order to understand the counterintuitiveness of these computers, I will have to uh, go a little bit into, uh, into mathematics and look at one of the most mystical problems of quantum information, the most confounding, the most confusing and puzzling questions of quantum computers. Uh, and, and that is the concept of measurement. Now let's uh, lo look at this concept in, in, in some detail. Now suppose my relevant degree of freedom is the polarization of a photon. We know that the polarization of a photon constitutes a qubit. And therefore, it can always be written as a superposition of ket 0 and ket 1 with some coefficients, C0 and C1. So this is the general form of the polarization degree of freedom of a single photon. And these numbers C0 and C1, both of them are really complex numbers. Okay, so far so good. This zero corresponds, for example, to horizontal polarization. And cat1 corresponds to vertical polarization. And if I were to uh, look at look at this concept from a, a pictorial perspective. So the horizontal polarization can be represented by an electric field that is horizontal, whereas the vertical polarization can be represented by something that is the electric field that is vertically oriented. And I can have arbitrary polarizations, say at an angle 45, at an angle 22.5 degrees. And I can also have other slightly stranger forms of electric field vectors. For example, suppose I draw an electric field vector and it rotates as the photon is propagating in the forward direction. So it rotates counterclockwise. This could be called right circularly polarized. I could have the electric field that is going 
in a clockwise fashion. This is left circularly polarized field. No matter what kind of polarization we're talking about, any quantum state could be represented in this general form. Okay. So I think we really need to be clear about this point. Therefore, if, if there are any confusions, uh, please, uh, please let me know. All right, so far, so good. Now, <clears throat> now let's uh, look at the problem of measurement. Suppose I have a device which is like a traffic sergeant and it sorts out photons according to their polarization. Let's call this device a polarization beam splitter. And this is the general symbol for such a device that I'm going to use. And in short, I will call it PBS. All right. Now, this uh, polarization beam splitter has a certain property. And the property is that a photon comes in, right? So this is an incoming photon and it is in a particular quantum state, ket psi whose form is, as you all know, in its general form given by some coefficient C0 ket0, some coefficient C1 ket1. So this is the totally arbitrary general form of an incoming photon. And we're looking at its polarization. Now there are two output channels. There are two possibilities for the photon to come out. One possibility is that the photon goes straight through. If the photon goes straight through, then this device has a property then that this transmitted photon is in the state ket zero. And if a photon is reflected, then the the fo reflected photon must be in a state cat one. So really this device is sorting out the incoming photons into two channels. I will use the word channels here. There is a cat zero channel and a cat one channel. Now, suppose I just have a single photon coming in. Just one photon. Now, suppose I have, I, I do something else. I have a detector. I place a detector here. And the detector, as I mentioned yesterday, is shown by this D symbol with a wiggly line representing a cable of some kind. So I have a zero detector and I have a one detector. All right. Now let's get to the basics of the measurement problem. If my input photon, if my input photon were in the state get zero, then the detector zero, this detector will register a photon. And these are special kinds of detectors. They can detect single photons. They are called single photon counters. So if my input photon had been prepared in a state cat zero, then the probability that the detector zero clicks is 100% or one. If my input state were cat one, then the probability that the detector one clicks is one and the probability that the detector zero clicks is zero. Here, the probability that the detector one clicks is zero. All right, so this is clear. So if I were to input photons that were in the state cat zero, of course, only this detector will re register a photon, whereas this detector will always remain silent. It will never fire, it will never trigger. 
so far so good however if my input state were a superposition say 1 over under root 2 get 0 plus 1 over under root 2 get 1 so it's a superposition of horizontal and vertical polarization and physically this corresponds to the input photon being having a polarization which is 45 degrees with respect to the horizontal. Now if such a photon were input into the polarizing beam splitter, what's going to happen? Remember. I just have a single photon coming in, just a single photon whose quantum state is this psi over here. I have a detector in the zero channel and I have a detector in the one channel. So this is P zero. This detector gives me P one. Here I'm talking about probabilities, remember. So how do I calculate these probabilities? In order to calculate these probabilities, I will use the concept of what is called the inner product. I know that this channel has been defined as the ket zero channel. And this channel has been defined as the ket one output channel. All right, and now what I would like to do, I would like to determine the probability P0 and the probability P1. And how do I do that? I do that in the following fashion. Suppose I want to calculate the probability P0. What is, so if I have an incoming photon in an arbitrary quantum state, what is the probability that my detector zero fires or triggers? How do I calculate that probability? I calculate that probability in, in the following fashion. Uh, but let me, let me digress a, a, a little bit here, uh, just to give you a quick recap. Suppose I have a vector A. This is a vector A. And I have another vector B at some angle with respect to A. Now, if I'm interested in finding out the projection of A on B, I will just drop this line uh, such that it forms a right angle with vector B. And this projection would be given by the dot product of A with B. Right, correct? So, this dot product is also called the inner product. All right, so far, so good. Now, exactly in an analogous fashion, I could compute the probability P0. How do I do that? The probability P0 is found out in the following fashion. What is my input quantum state? It is ket psi. What channel do I want to find the probability in? It is get zero. So I take the inner product and I'm going to show what notation to use. I want to take the inner product of ket zero with ket psi with ket zero, which means I would like to find the projection of ket psi on ket zero. So the inner product is a function of two kets, just like a dot b is a function of two vectors. Kets are analogous to vectors in quantum mechanics. So I find out the inner product of the input state with the channel, the output channel, uh, uh, whose probability I'm interested in determining. And the symbol for this inner product in quantum mechanics goes as the following. I take the ket psi and put the vector or the ket zero, but I put it in such a fashion that this 
greater than sign becomes a less than sign. So this is my notation here. So this is a notation here. And then I take the, now this could come out as a complex number. This could be complex. It could be real, but in general, it's complex. And then I take the modulus square of this complex number. And I and this is how I determine the probability P0. So uh, let me give you an example here. Uh, I hope I, I'm not going too fast and this is all making sense so far. So let's look at, at a real example. <clears throat> So if my input state psi is one over under root two cat zero plus one over under root two cat one, and I would like to find out the probability that detector zero, this detector clicks. There's a photon coming in. I would like to see what's the probability that this detector clicks, P naught. Uh, what I would need to do is calculate this, this object here, find out what this object means. So how do I do that? It's really simple. <clears throat> I take cat psi, form the inner product with cat zero. The quantum state written in this fashion is also called a bra. And the quantum state written in this fashion is called a cat, by the way. So, but all of this is a notation. It's, it's the power of the Dirac notation that allows you to do these manipulations. So I'm finding an inner product here. So, cat psi is simply one over under root two cat zero. plus one over under root two cat one. So this is cat psi. This is all of this here. This thing is all of this. Cat zero is in the form of a bra. So I write the bra here. So I need to compute this quantity here. Now the prop, now there's an important property of quantum mechanics. First of all, it is linear. So if I have a vector A and I take the inner product with B plus C, then the inner product is linear. So I can do the inner product of A with B and later I could do the inner product of A with C. Exactly the same concept applies here. Yes, is there a question? All right. So. Exactly this linearity principle can be applied here. This one over under root two is just a, a scalar. It's just a number one over under root two bra zero cat zero. So I'm expanding this, this, this quantity here. This quantity, I'm just expanding it out. So I take the inner product of cat zero with itself plus the inner product of cat zero with one. All right, <clears throat> now comes another concept. If I take the inner product of a cat with itself, the answer is always one, which means that the projection of a vector on itself is always one. So this number here gives me one. On the other hand, the projection of a vector with another vector, a cat with another state, which is orthogonal. So cat zero and cat one are orthogonal states, which means that the inner product between these states is zero. Likewise, cat one inner product with cat zero will be zero because cat zero and cat one are orthogonal states. What does this mean if I had a beam splitter?
and I had a P0 and a P1 and I had an incoming photon say in the state cat 0 P0 will click 100% of the times and there is no chance that P1 will click which means that the overlap of cat 0 with this channel with the cat 1 channel is going to be 0 and this is what is represented over here and vice versa if I were to input cat 1 this detector is going to click with 100% probability and this detector will always remain silent which shows that the cat 0 channel and the cat 1 channel are mutually orthogonal and this is what is represented mathematically here. Therefore this number here turns out to be 0. So this gives you a number. The inner product is always a number. It could be a complex number. Just by chance we are getting real numbers here but it could in general be a complex number. So if I compute this further the answer is 1 over under root 2. So now I've calculated this inner product and in order to determine the probability I take the modulus square of this inner product. One half. So everything looks good here. If I were to input the quantum state psi which is an equal superposition of cat 0 and cat 1 then the probability that this detector clicks is going to be one half exactly 50 percent and the probability that this detector clicks you can similarly compute this probability p1 p1 is going to be the inner product of the input state with cat1 take the modulus square as well so the inner product of 1 with 0 gives me 0 and the inner product of 1 with 1 gives me 1. So I'm left with 1 over under root 2 modulus square which is 1 half. All right. In, in, in general form, if I were and that's the reason why we have this, why we have these coefficients 1 over under root 2 rather than one half uh, because you need to take the modulus square later on as well and these probabilities p0 plus p1 always add up to one this is called normalization therefore i can have a state like this one over under root three cat zero plus two over under root three cat one this is a legitimate quantum state because I can take the modulus square 1 over, 1 over 3 plus 2 over 3 and the sum of these modulus squares is equal to 1. And the, the, the total probability, so if I have two channels, if I were to compute the probability that a photon comes here and the probability that the photon comes here and I input a certain photon, then the sum of these probabilities must be equal 1, must be equal to 1. That's why these coefficients are constrained. And I can put this in mathematical form in the following fashion. Suppose my input quantum state is C0 cat 0 plus C1 cat 1. Can anyone tell me what the probability of the photon coming in channel 0, what would that probability be? So C0 and C1 are now complex numbers. So I invite you to just speak up here. So C0 mod square. Right. It's going to be C0 mod square. So I just take the overlap of the entire quantum state with cat 0. I will get C0 and then I take the modulus square. And <clears throat> I already showed yesterday that this C0 mod square is simply C0 complex conjugate multiplied by C0. Likewise, P1 is going to be C1 mod square. C1 star into C1. And normalization really means that C0 mod square plus C1 mod square equals 1. 
All right, so far so good. Now let me, I, I just want to give you two or three minutes on your own, on your notebooks. I'm writing a, a general quantum state. Say, <clears throat> Mm, 1 over under root 5 cat 0 plus e i uh, So I so let let's put let's make this one over three so what is the probability of obtaining cat one? So just take two or three minutes and uh and just shoot out an answer here. So I give you two or three minutes to to work this out on your own. Two over three. Just signal when, when you already have an answer, when anyone has an answer. A lot of the candidates have written their answers in the chat. All right, so can you, all right, let me have a look in the chat box. Oh, two or three, all right. Yeah, looks good. So I just, uh, how do I do that? I simply take the inner product of psi with cat one and take the modulus square. And the answer indeed is two or three. Now, what is the role of this global phase? Or oh, sorry, of this phase? This phase sorry. is sorry, we can't see your screen. You all right? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, just, just a minute, let me. Just a minute. I don't know. All right. So can, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right, okay. So what is the role of this phase over here? This phase is central to the concept of, of quantum computing. Now let me give you an, another example. And now we're going to build our simplest quantum computer. Now remember one thing, measurement is a really tricky concept. So when we looked at our polarization beam splitter and we had our detectors here, we input a photon This is the cat zero channel. This is the cat one channel. And I'm inputting a particular quantum state, cat psi. So if I have an arrangement of this kind, a photon that comes in either goes on the cat zero channel or the cat one channel. And once it falls uh, onto the 
uh, detector, the photon is demolished or destroyed. And I can't use this photon for anything subsequent, for a subsequent processing. So this is an example of a demolitive measurement. Demolitive means something which is destroyed. Now suppose I have an arrangement of this kind. <clears throat> and I also hinted to this uh, in, in the previous lecture yesterday. I have a polarizing beam spitter. A photon comes in in a particular quantum state psi. And there is a block here or a dump here. I just don't care what happens to the photon that, that goes out here. But then a photon comes out here and I put all of this thing, all of this arrangement in a big black box, which has one input port and one output port. Right? So all of this is now in a big, even though it's a black box, but I've drawn it green. Now, if I look at this photon here, and I'm not doing a measurement, I don't have a detector here. This is an outgoing photon. I will be sure that this photon has been prepared in the state cat zero. So this is how I prepare a quantum state. And I'm also doing a kind of a measurement here because even though I do not have a detector on the outgoing channel, I know for sure that this photon has been prepared in a state cat zero. And if it were to be measured subsequently in, in, in a polarizing beam spitter of this kind, so subsequently I input this cat zero into this polarizing beam splitter that I've drawn on the right, then this detector is going to click 100% of the times. So this example is an example of a non-demolitive measurement or a preparation. I am preparing the quantum state, the, the photon polarization in a particular quantum state. Now let's look at the simplest quantum computer as I promised. And this re would reveal the most counterintuitive aspects of uh, of quantum computing. Now, suppose what I'm going to do now is not look at the uh, not look at the polarization of a photon. Rather, I'm going to look at the path of a photon, right? As you know, I could I could use a variety of degrees of freedom. Now I have a beam splitter. which is not a polarizing beam splitter, rather it is just a beam splitter and a 50, 50 beam splitter. And it has an input channel and two output channels. A photon comes in, so let me first draw the beam splitter, right? So this is my general notation for a beam splitter. I input a quantum state So there are two possible input states. And since I'm encoding the quantum degree of freedom as the path of a photon, if a photon comes in through this channel, it is labeled cat zero. Okay. And there are two output paths. If the photon is transmitted, I call it cat zero. If the photon is reflected, I call this channel cat one. So I'm not, I'm not, not looking at the polarization degree of freedom. I don't care what the polarization of the photon is. That's not of my immediate interest. Rather, <clears throat> I'm looking at the path or the propagation direction of the photon. All right. So I'm ignoring the polarization degree of freedom, just looking at the path. Likewise, I can have my detectors here. So if I input cat zero, this detector will click 100% of the times. And I can find out that probability by the inner product rule. This detector is going to click 0% of the times. All right. 
Now let's build <coughs> something which is really, really, really interesting. Let me first draw the diagram for, for this setup. So now I'm going to build an interferometer. I have a I have a beam splitter here. And I have a beam splitter here. Two perfect beam splitters. And what I do is I place a mirror here. and I place a mirror here. Now these two mirrors are totally reflecting. They reflect all the photons that fall on upon them. And eventually I would like to put two detectors, not after the first beam splitter, but after the second beam splitter. Okay, this output channel is cat zero, this output channel is cat one. And there's a probability of this detector clicking and a probability of the detector P1 clicking. All right, so I take all of these uh, units and put them on an optical table. Uh, I can build this system. Now we do it in our lab as well. Uh, and I have to align the optical beam, etc. And somehow I input, I prepare a single photon, which is not easy to prepare, but I do prepare a single photon. Let me draw the beam splitters properly. So here is my second beam splitter. Here is my first beam splitter. So I call this B1 and I call this beam splitter B2. Okay, I call this mirror M1 and I call this mirror M2. All right. Now what happens is, now I, I would like to see what, what, what's going on here. <clears throat> So I input a photon. In a particular quantum state. Now there's a probability that this photon goes straight here. And this photon goes straight here. Uh, it is either transmitted or reflected. And when it is reflected from this mirror M2, it comes here. And when it is reflected from this mirror, it comes here. All right. So this is my scheme over here. And this beam splitter has a certain property. And the property of this beam splitter is that if, okay, I would like to define a property of this beam splitter. This beam splitter has a property that it creates a superposition. All right, so I, I'm going to come to that in a minute. All right, now, uh, if, if I were to perform this experiment in the lab, what happens is that this detector clicks with a 50% probability, and this detector clicks with a 50% probability. Uh, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry about that. 
what is your what is your uh, intuitive notion about which of these detectors is going to click what do you think is going to happen if i have an arrangement of this kind so i'm asking you a question here so can anyone Can anyone point out what's going to happen here? Um, so it may be either zero, either one, or maybe a superposition. Sorry, can you speak again? So I'm asking that uh, it may be either zero cat or one cat or maybe a superposition. Where where is this going to be a superposition? Uh, sir, in between. Hmm. Zero and one, and the P P not and P one. Okay, so all right. So let me uh, let me elaborate this a, a bit further. Suppose I have a, a single beam sphere, just one beam sphere. A photon comes in. A photon comes in. It can either go to the channel cat zero, or it can go to the channel cat one. And I'm looking at a property of the B sphere that if I were to put a detector here and a detector here. Then this detector is going to click fifty percent of the times, and this detector is going to click fifty percent of the times. All right. So this is my experimental observation. Okay. So whenever I take a beam splitter in the laboratory, which is a fifty-fifty beam splitter, this is what it does. <coughs> it it simply uh directs the photon to the output channel cat 0 with 50% probability and to the output channel cat 1 with the 50% probability this is something that i observe in the laboratory okay now when i have these two beams which is b1 and b2 composed together and this is a 50-50 beam splitter and so is B two a fifty fifty beam sphere. I would expect that half of the times P not uh, detector zero is going to click, and half of the times detector one is going to click. All right. So this is what I intuitively ex expect. So each of these beam splitters, when they are put together in tandem, Baba. one after the other, they are Baba. they are going to. Uh, uh they are going to act like random coin tosses and uh, there is no reason why why this is not going to happen that the two detectors are going to click 50% of the times because beam splitter 1 is reflecting or transmitting and beam splitter 2 is reflecting or transmitting and half of the half of the photons go here half the photons go go here half of them go here and here you have a 50-50 beam sphere. So half of them will go into output channel zero and half of them will go into output channel one. Okay, so this is your intuition. This is what you expect classically. All right, so am I making sense here? Can I just uh, see in the chat box if, if you understand this intuitive picture? Okay, this looks good. However, when I actually perform this experiment, something really strange happens. And the strange thing that happens is that the detector zero clicks with 100% probability. Whereas detector one doesn't click at all. This is the really strange thing that I'm talking about. The photon never lands on detector one. It always goes to detector zero, even though beam splitter is a 50-50 device 
and beam stator one is also a 50-50 device. So this is what actually happens in the laboratory. And this is the basic kind of, of a quantum computer. And how does it work? Let me explain this. All right, so I just need, uh, I just need two minutes to uh, have some silence in my room. Just, just hold on please. All right, so I'm back. Now what's going to happen is the following. If I if I have a beam splitter, I define a property of the beam splitter. A photon comes in in the state cat zero because this is the input channel and it creates a superposition. Now it's hard to draw a superposition, but that single photon is now in a state of a superposition. It's in both channels at the same time, in other words, and it, it is rather in a state cat zero plus cat one with a coefficient of one over under root two with each. So, so the nice thing about this experiment here is that I input a cat zero and I create a superposition here, right? All of this, what I'm doing here is creating a superposition. One over under root two cat zero plus one over under root two cat one. And I do not have any detectors in between the two beam splitters. I'm letting the photon, I'm letting the quantum process take its full run. It's, I'm not probing in between the beam splitters. I'm not making a measurement or an observation between the two beam splitters. Rather, I'm letting the photon take its full run, do whatever it likes, the beam splitter has a property, it creates a superposition. And when it creates a superposition, I have created this quantum state, cat zero plus cat one. And then I look what's gonna happen at the final beam splitter. Okay, so now uh, I, I can describe uh, the, the process in, in, in more mathematical terms here. I input a quantum, if I were to input a quantum state cat zero onto a beam splitter, I create this superposition. So in order to define uh, what a beam splitter does, I also need to define what it does to an input state cat1. If my photon came in from the other channel, from here, cat1, then it is either reflected or transmitted. And in such a case, the beam splitter also produces a superposition. But now the superposition is slightly different from the superposition that I've written over here. This superposition is has a plus sign, which is really due to e raised per i zero, because e raised per i zero is one. Now, if I were to input the state cat one, the same beam splitter would produce a superposition, which is of the following form, one over under root two zero plus e raised per i pi, one over under root two cat one, which is simply one over under root two cat zero minus one over under root two cat one. So these two, formula or these two prescriptions define a beam splitter. So in order to define a device in a quantum computer, 
you really need to know what it does to the two kinds of input states, to the two orthogonal states. What does it do to cat 0 and what does it do to cat 1? All right. So with this definition of a beam splitter, let's see how we describe our, our combination of two beam splitters with composed with two mirrors. All right. So this is beam splitter 1 and I have beam splitter 2 here. And I have mirrors, perfect mirrors. And the role of these mirrors is just to steer the direction of the photon. A photon comes in, in a particular state, cat zero. I don't know what happens in between. It's a black box for me. I'm not making any detection in between B1 and B2. I'm letting the quantum process run its full course in its full glory. And then I have two detectors on the two output channels, cat zero and cat one. All right. So let me draw the detectors as well. Here is detector zero, P zero. And here is detector one, P one. So now let's analyze this circuit mathematically. Okay. I start off with input state. This is my input quantum state, cat zero. This one here, this thing. First, I pass it through a beam splitter B1, which is a device. In the next lecture, I will show that this is a, called a quantum gate. So I input this state to a beam splitter. And what is the property of a beam splitter? The property of the beam splitter is that it converts cat zero into a superposition, into an equal superposition with a plus sign in between. Okay. So cat zero is converted to one over under root two cat zero plus one over under root two cat one. All right. Now these photons, now remember, this could be a single photon. So I don't need to use the plural with the photon, it's just a single photon, which is in a superposition here. It's in this state cat zero plus cat one with the one over under root two. And I'm not probing it, I'm not doing I'm not being impatient and doing a measurement. I'm not trying to find out what path the photon is taking. I'm hiding the information of which path. I'm not interested in finding out the path of a photon. I'm just looking at the final outcomes. Now, these mirrors just steer the direction of the photon. So they really do nothing. And now I would like to find out the effect of B2 on this quantum state. Now, remember that B2 is being fed in with a superposition. This superposition, which I just like to draw in a ghost-like fashion here, which is, don't take it too literally, this superposition of a single photon, we're not talking about two photons and we cannot split photons, but the photon has a quantum field that is spread out in both of these parts. This photon is being fed into the beam state of B2. Now what we would like to find out is what is the output state. So I like to know what is the output state here. Okay, after the second beam splitter, and then I will determine the probabilities. Now I know that quantum mechanics is linear. So I know what the beam splitter does on state cat zero, and I know what the beam splitter does on state cat one. And here is here is how I defined the action of the beam splitter. So let me do this step by step. Uh, I like to use different colors here. So this one over under root two, I just write it as it is. I know that when a beam splitter acts on cat zero, let me recap, what do I get? I get this state over here. Okay. So what I could do is I could just the action of beam splitter B2 on cat zero is given by one over under root two cat zero plus one over under root two cat one. Okay. Plus now this plus comes in here. This one over under root two is just carries over. Now I would like to find out the action of the beam splitter two on cat one. And what is this? This action is one over under root two 
कैट जीरो माइनस वन ओवर अंडर रूट टू कैट वन ओके नाउ इट लुक्स रियली रियली क्लियर टू मी दिस प्लस कैंसल आउट विद दिस माइनस एंड आई एम लेफ्ट विद and i'm left simply with cat 0 half cat 0 plus half cat 0 is 0 so now what i've done is <clears throat> now i take this input output state and find out the probability that detect a zero clicks that is just going to be cat 0 overlap with cat 0 this is equal to 1 and it goes without saying that the probability of detecting on the other detector is going to be zero so even though this is a random device classically it's a random device it sorts out the photon into a cat 0 or a cat 1 channel with 50% probability and this is a random device i string two random devices together but lo and behold only one of the detector clicks in a deterministic fashion so this is the really counterintuitive thing about uh, quantum mechanics uh, and this is the simplest kind of quantum computer that i can think of it's based on the concept of interferometry interference and the interference occurs because there is a relative phase difference between this term and this term and that phase difference is pi so let me elaborate this a little bit further but are there any questions up to this point Um, sir, there was a question asked by Ravel. He says, "If we're using fifty-fifty beam splitter, then how could we get superposition?" So, a fifty-fifty beam splitter. You see, a fifty-fifty beam splitter means that it creates a superposition. If you are dealing with single photons, the real beauty of this concept appears. Suppose I shine. instead of single photons i shine laser light on this beam splitter now lasers produce i don't know hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of zillions of photons in a second they they produce an intense beam now if i shine laser light on this beam splitter half of the flux of photons will go to one channel and half of the flux of the photons will go to the other channel <clears throat> now what if i attenuate this laser beam and i attenuate it such that i just drop down to getting a single photon at a time inside the apparatus just one photon i attenuate it so highly now there are novel ways of doing that but just for the sake of argument let's say i attenuate the laser beam now what's going to happen to that single photon if i were to build this quantum computer this interferometer and i just had this beam splitter here which i'm showing here and i put detectors at the two output channels then that single photon can either go to one channel or the other okay but if i put another beam splitter at the end b2 at the end and i don't put detectors in between then only one of the detectors at the output is going to click now how do i describe this this is what happens in the lab how do i describe there is no other way of describing this experimental outcome than by positing by proposing that in between the two beam splitters the photon exists in a superposition state so this is the famous experiment which feynman calls that the single photon or the single electron interferes with itself i have just one photon coming into an interferometer and it's interfering with itself there are certain outputs that are never observed in this case p1 is never observed which means that destructive interference happens here and constructive interference happens here and that can only be true if the photon acts like a wave it is it has a wave like property it is spread out in both of these paths at the same time even though the photon cannot be split so if we were to measure which path the photon takes and how do i measure the path of the photon i put a detector in here if i were to put a detector in here say let's call this p3 then if this detector clicks then the photon is destroyed 
and I don't see anything on P0 and P1. However, if this detector does not click, then I know that the photon has traversed this path. And when it has traversed this path, I have obtained information about the path of the photon. And when I obtain the which path information, then the interference collapses, then P0 and P1 are going to click with 50% probability. All right, so if I let go of the which path information, I can see quantum interference. And if I am insistent and obstinate that I would like to know the which path information, then interference will not happen. And uh, I will just see a classical result. Okay, so I, I hope I have any more questions before I just uh, take I last. have one question. Yes. I'm so sorry, Asamiko. I have a question uh, uh, just to, uh, you know, have a more discussion about what you just described. Uh, if we uh, put a detected P3, uh, can you move the screen a little bit up? Yes, just a minute, please. Yeah. G. So if, if P3 does not click, that means that a single photon is going upward. So uh, what can we comment about the state of this photon? Either it will be in uh, cat zero state or one state. It's going to be cat one. Cat one. It's, it's going to be cat one. So when it uh, hits beam two, then I'll get uh, then P one will uh, will click with hundred percent probability and P not will click, uh, click no. with zero percent probability. No, if I if I input cat one onto B two. Yes. Let's see what's going to happen. Oh yes, yes, okay. So if I input say now this is my cat one. Right, coming into the B instead of BS2, P2. My output state is going to be cat zero minus cat one, right? Minus one cat one, yes. So now if I put two, two detectors here and here. Yes, yes. yes. So and let's call this cat phi, okay? Let's call this output okay. state cat phi. So cat phi probability on cat zero is going to be half. And mm -hmm. the probability on one is going to be half, okay? Yeah. So then okay. both of these detectors are going to click. Okay, thank you so much. So, thank you. So, so much. the key point is that interference is observed when you preserve the superposition. If if you do not want, if you want to measure the superposition in between, you are impatient and you would like to do a measurement, then the interference collapses, the superposition collapses, and the wave function collapses, and you do not get uh, quantum interference effects. Now, the nice thing, just sorry, I'm running a little bit over time, but the last five minutes, suppose I, I, I do another experiment, a, a variant of this experiment. So I have a beam splitter. Two mirrors, once again. And in one of the paths, I put in a medium, some kind of liquid or some crystal. <clears throat> and I label that by, by the symbol phi. Now let's see what's going to happen. Photon comes in. Sorry, 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 sorry. B1, B2. All right, so, and then I have two detectors once again. I call this P0 and I call this P1. Now the property of this device, this phase shifter or a crystal, it could be crystal, a liquid, is that, is the following. If I input the state cat zero onto this phase shifter. It picks up a phase phi. Okay. Now the, the power of complex numbers and superpositions is going to be come to the four. If I input it with cat one, I also pick up a phase. Uh, all right, so 
oh sorry let me redefine <laughs> if i input it with cat 0 nothing happens and if i input it with cat 1 it picks up a phase okay so this is my property of a phase shifter okay and this medium can be logically it can be anywhere it's in the superposition path of the superposition right okay like this now all of the examples that i'm giving there of quantum gates and i'll explain that in the next lecture all right now let's see what's going to happen what is the so my objective is to find out probability p naught and the probability p1 okay i input the quantum state cat 0 sorry i input the quantum state cat 0 the beam switch the b1 creates a superposition okay so far so good And now you know the importance of this factor one over under root two. It's because of normalization. And then I have the phase shifting medium inside the path of the superposition. Now what this phase shifting medium does, it does nothing of course to the scalar part. Cat zero remains cat zero. And cat one picks up a phase phi. Okay. People who do optics can also identify the phase shifter with a device which is called a retarder or a wave plate. Anyway, that's besides the point. So now I have a superposition and the action of the phase medium is to also have a superposition but some relative phase. So this is a relative phase between cat zero and cat one, okay? Now, all of this state goes into the beam splitter number two. All right, I just use the linearity principle once again. One over under root two, cat zero is now transformed into one over under root two, cat zero plus cat one. Now, e is per i phi is just a number. Okay, nothing happens to this. Cat one is now transformed into one over under root two, cat zero minus cat one. Okay, and I want to close the brackets, the big brackets. So this is my output state. <coughs> and what I could do now is I could just solve it. I could just expand it out. One half cat zero plus one half cat one plus one half e i phi cat zero minus one half e i phi cat one right is, is have i done this correctly okay so i just gather these terms together this and this get one half one plus e i phi cat zero plus one half one minus e i phi cat one okay so this is my output state let's call this state psi two okay so this is a state that i observe over here here psi two right so this is my state the output state now i would like to find out the probability that detector zero clicks and the probability that detector one clicks so let me first find out the inner product of psi two with cat zero that inner product is one half one plus e i phi because the inner product of cat zero with this term is zero now what i would like to do i would like to take the modulus square of this that is the probability that detector zero clicks. Modulus square of this is one over four, one plus E minus I phi, complex conjugate of this number plus into one plus E I phi. 
excuse me, 1, 4, 1 plus e i phi plus e minus i phi plus 1. This gives me 1 over 4, 2 plus 2 cosine phi half 1 plus cosine phi, which is cosine square phi by 2. So the probability that detector 0 clicks is cosine square phi by 2. Likewise, if I were to calculate the probability that detector one clicks, I would need to find out this thing. And if, if I were to repeat this calculation, the probability turns out to be sine square phi by two. Now this is really beautiful. This is so amazing because what this shows us is that by changing this phi here, by changing the medium here, I can change the length of the medium, for example. I can, if this is a liquid crystal, I can change the applied electric field. I can change the interference pattern. I can change whether the probability that detector P0 clicks and the probability that detector P1 clicks. And this is completely under my control if I had the ability to maneuver phi. And if I were to make a graph, of, so if I put phi here and I put P naught here, then this probability is a function of phi and it's a function such that it's cosine square phi by two. So it's going to look like this. A perfect interference fringe. This is what an interference fringe looks like. And if this is my P naught here, and if I were to plot P1, it's simply sine square phi by two, it's gonna look like this. This is my P1. And the sum of these terms, sum of these probabilities is always equal to one, as it should be for a normalized state. So this is the process of quantum interference. I have built an interferometer. It's the simplest quantum computer you can think of. Uh, I'm manipulating quantum states. I'm inputting quantum states. I have these logic gates, these devices that act on the quantum states that change the quantum states. This is also a quantum, uh, quantum gate or a quantum device. And I can maneuver what outputs do I get. Finally, I always have to do a measurement. I always need to have detectors, but I don't want to do a measurement in between. I need an initial state. So for every quantum computer, you need an initial quantum state. You need to do a measurement. You need to do a quantum process, which is not disturbed by the environment because the environment can also make measurements. Uh, you, so you need to preserve the coherence or the superposition. If, if, you, if this coherence breaks, it's called decoherence. So you would like to protect against decoherence. And now, how, why is this useful? When we learn about quantum algorithms uh, in the next to next lecture, we'll actually see how this can all be put to good use. All right, so <clears throat> I think this is all from my, uh, from my side uh, at the moment, and I'll be happy to take uh, some questions. So any questions? <clears throat> yeah, you can just speak up as well. We'll try to share the PDFs uh, of these two lectures and uh, we're discussing the uh, sharing of the videos as well. <clears throat> I think the videos need a bit of editing, but we'll try our best to share the videos too. Um, sir, Hassan Rizwan asks yes, that I'm struggling with the math in some terms. What should I read or brush up on to catch up? 
Uh, Hassan, were you in yesterday's class? No, Just I start. wasn't. I'm sorry, I, I I wasn't able to attend uh, yesterday's class, and I joined about fifteen twenty minutes late. Okay. Today. All right. So, Hassan, what I, oh, Hassan, what I would suggest is that uh, once we share the videos or the lecture notes from yesterday, I think it's pretty clear. It's just some simple uh, algebra in in a particular disguise. So, I think you'll be able to look at those lecture notes and catch up. Okay, it's perfect. Not a big problem. Okay, sounds good. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for the lecture. Uh, my name is Hanadi, and I want to ask you about the first example uh, with two beams and two mirrors. Can you scroll the screen up? Yes, just a minute. This one? Yeah. Yeah. How, how can... Uh, this 50-50 beam splitter give us 50-50 beam splitter when we first used a zero kit. We should use, uh, I think, Psi contains zero and one kit to get 50-50 beam splitter. Okay, so uh, now, now this is a property of the beam splitter. What a beam splitter does is that when light comes into one one of its channels, it could come into cat zero or it could mm -hmm. come into cat one, either of yeah. the channels. It uh, with 50% probability light goes out in one channel and with 50% probability it goes out into the other channel. So mm -hmm. this is the property of the beam splitter. If I, if you look here, if you look at the screen at, at this point in time, so I input cat zero. Now this input cat zero is a path of a photon. If if I input cat zero, I'm still getting cat zero plus cat one. Yes. All right. And if I'm inputting, uh, so I'm creating a superposition. Okay. So half of the light mm -hmm. would go into, if this were a large number of photons, so like classical light, light from a laser, half of the flux would go into one channel and half of the flux would go out into the other channel. But light doctor... White, yeah, yeah. But let, doctor, me, yeah. let me just finish. I will just come to you in a minute. So if the input is cat one, the other channel is mm -hmm. the light comes in from the other port, still the output is going to be cat is going to be a superposition of cat zero and cat one. Yes, right? with so minus. With the minus sign. But still, if you yes. put a detector here and a detector here. Half mm -hmm. of the time this will click and half of the time this will click. But so this we, is the property of the beam splitter, yes. But uh, doctor, uh, the before the example that I mentioned, yeah. you uh, give us an example of a uh, path of the photon and uh, the kit zero give us 100% and yeah. the detector kit zero. <clears throat> yeah, but that was a different kind of beam splitter. That was a polarizing beam splitter. Let me, uh, so this thing, no, this is incorrect. This, this one, is yeah. incorrect. Yeah, this is incorrect. This is incorrect, sorry. okay. Sorry, 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 this is my mistake. This is incorrect. Okay, thank you, doctor, because right. this is, yes. was yes. my this, mistake from the first lecture. No, 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 this is, this is incorrect. Uh, previously, when I was talking about beam splitters, they were polarizing beam splitters. They are different. They are the yeah. degree of our polarization. Now we're talking about the photon. Uh, sorry um, about that. So now the, the point is, is clear. Yeah, OK, mm -hmm. OK. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Yes, any, any more questions? Um, there is a question by Anas uh, Saleh. Mm -hmm. He asks that how, how does the phase shift alter the phase of st state one but not state zero? Yeah, okay, so let me. So, this is a technical point, slightly technical point. So, <laughs> I, I just did not mention it before, but let me clarify one thing. 
physically speaking, what a real phase shifter does is that zero gives us E I phi one get zero. I didn't want to go into these details, but now that you've asked, I'm 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 mentioning this. Cat zero gives me EI phi one. Cat one gives me EI phi two. Cat one. Okay. Really, th physically, this is what happens. Now, if I have a state cat zero plus cat one, and it passes through a phase shifter. Okay, so this is the action of the phase shifter phi. <clears throat> it gives me one over under root two, e i phi one cat zero, plus e i phi two cat one. Now I can manipulate this in the following fashion: one over under root two. Okay, so I just take e i phi one common, one over under root two cat zero plus e raised per i phi two minus phi one. Cat one. Now in quantum mechanics, if I have a state of this kind, say I call it some chi. If I have a state of this kind, this phase factor here is called a global phase factor because it is present with both cat zero and both cat one. This phase factor here is a relative phase factor. Now it turns out. That global phase factors do not matter. They are inconsequential. They have no consequence. They are totally not needed. Why? Because if I take the inner product of chi with anything, with say zero, and I take the modulus square, this just disappears. Because, uh, as you know, when I take the complex conjugate, I get a e raised to minus i phi one. So it just disappears. So all global phase factors are immaterial. Therefore, I can ignore the phase that appears on on cat zero. Okay, I can ignore this, and I can define this phi one minus phi two to be my phase of interest. Okay, so your point is valid, but it is of no consequence. Okay, I hope I've answered your question to the best of my abilities. Okay, I is it clear? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Islam, sir. Welcome, Islam. I've got a well. I've got a ton of questions, but I'm just gonna restrict them to a few. Uh, the f first of all, uh, I I would like to ask that uh, when you're talking about the interferometer, the the, the single photon. It's not being created by the beam splitters, right? The single photon cannot be created by the beam splitters themselves. You have to no. do something. You have to use a BBO crystal or something, right? So, yeah. am I right in that? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's the first one. Um, okay, how do you how do you confirm in a in a, in, in the lab that you're what you're seeing is actually a single photon? How do you, how do you confirm that that this is a single photon? Yeah. We do what is called a correlation experiment, a G two naught experiment, <clears throat> second order correlation, which means the following: you have a beam splitter, and you have detectors. <clears throat> and and what you observe is, okay, what you would like to do is. You take this to a. You have a wire here, and you have a wire here, and you put this into a device which measures coincidences. So you input a photon. Okay, let me explain this. You input a photon, a single photon, a supposedly single photon, and when you have a single photon. then so this is channel a this is channel b when channel a clicks channel b will never click when channel b clicks channel a will never click so the rate of coincidences is below a certain threshold 
then you can confirm that these photons that are coming in, they are single photons or they are anti-bunched and so on. So you do a coincidence experiment and you measure what is called the G2 naught, the second order correlation function. You can read more about it, but basically you do a coincidence. There should be zero coincidences uh, if you were to input a single photon. Okay, I just got one more question uh, related to what uh, another colleague asked before. Uh, I'm still confused in the fact that you're saying that you, uh, the first example you, you were using a polarizing beam splitter, now you're just using a simple beam splitter. Uh, whatever the case might be, um, uh, if you're talking about uh, one and zeros and you're talking about the quantum states, it has to be ha have a physical uh, quantity behind it. In this case, the polarization of the photon. So in, in either case, if you're, if, you're, if you're creating a quantum computer, you, you're going to use a polarization state. And uh, the question that, that the real question that I am confused about, let's just say I'm not using a beam splitter. I have a horizontally polarized photon, a single photon, and I use a polarizer, which is with, with this axis oriented in the same direction, that which is the horizontal direction. Then in that case, should I get a superposition? I don't think so. What do you think? No. First of all, you don't need to use the polarization degree of freedom. You can also use the path. You can use okay. both the path and the polarization. Uh, okay. there are other, uh, then you have a, not a qubit, but uh, a four-dimensional quantum system. Uh, but uh, uh, your second question was about huh, polarizer. A polarizer is a measurement device. <clears throat> it creates, a, it's a non-demolitive measurement. It creates a photon in a particular polarization state. If you have a horizontal polarization, no matter what comes in the output, if there is an output, it is horizontally polarized. So a polarizer is totally different from a beam splitter. A beam splitter is a coherent device. It produces a superposition, but a polarizer collapses a superposition into a particular quantum state. So it's a measurement device. So there's a world of difference between a beam splitter and a polarizer. Okay, I'm okay, sorry. So I, I, just, I just I like, I like to ask a final question. What if yeah. I orient the polarizer at a 45 degrees angle and, and the photon state that I'm inputting into it uh, is horizontally polarized? In that case, will I get a superposition or not? No, you will not get a superposition because you're doing a, a measurement. So if you have a polarizer at 45 degrees with respect to the horizontal and you input a state cat zero, which is horizontally polarized, let's let me relabel this as cat H, okay? There's nothing special with zeros and ones. You can use A, H, V or whatever you like. So if I input a horizontally polarized photon, the output is not going to be a... <clears throat> the <clears throat> okay, so how do we define an output? The output is going to be the state cat 45 degrees. That cat 45 degrees is 1 over under root 2 cat 0 plus cat 1. Now in that sense, it is a superposition, but the, the act of creating this superposition is by different means. It is by projecting cat zero onto this uh, 45 degrees polarized state. Now saying superposition is, is something which is up to our choice. If I were to use a basis and, that, and instead of the basis cat zero and cat one, I use the basis 45 degrees and minus 45 degrees then in this particular basis, this is not a superposition. This is an eigenstate. Yes, that, that's exactly what I'm asking. Yes, yes. If you okay, okay. change the basis set, you get a different answer then. Right. So the word superposition is arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think, I think that, that answers the question, I think. Thank you. All right. So any, uh, any last question? Uh, there's one more question from Rana Imran. He says that what will happen if mirrors are movable instead of fixed mirrors in interferometer? So one way of creating a relative phase difference phi, that's what they do in a Michelson interferometer or a Mark Zender interferometer. That instead of using this phase medium phi, they can make one of the mirrors movable. If they make one of the mirrors movable, it also creates a phase difference between the two beams that are reaching B2. Yes, so it is possible to create uh, interference by moving the mirrors, but then you really need precise control 
uh, of the mirrors, which is of the order of the wavelength of the photon. The wavelength of the photon is, a, say, if using red light, is about 600 nanometers. So you really need to have motors which have precise translation stages that have a re resolution around a few hundreds of nanometers. Yes, you can use movable mirrors. All right, so I think, uh, Mosina, that's uh, all for, for today. I, it's been a slightly longer session. But in the next lecture, we'll, we'll deal with quantum gates and do a little bit of more linear algebra and we'll take these concepts a bit further. So do stay tuned. And inshallah, we'll try to share the videos as well as the lecture notes uh, before, well in advance before the next uh, session. Thanks, Patrick. So thank you everyone, you may leave the meeting in your office.